Now, I said the normal distribution is very important. The reason it's very important is because of a result called the central limit theorem. So I'll state this, and then for the rest of the class, we're going to look at some examples of this. So the central limit theorem says the following. If I've got a number of variables, x1, x2, up to xn, which are independent in the sense I defined at the start of this class, and they're also identically distributed. That means they have the same probability distribution. Then So identically distributed, as I said, means that pi of xi is the same for all i. So they have the same probability distribution. If this is true, then the following, if I take the distribution of the sum, and I minus n times the mean, and divide by the square root of n times the variance, sorry, the square root of n times, okay. square root of n times the standard deviation of the square root of the variance, then this goes, as n goes to infinity, to a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one. Okay, so that's what it says. If I have lots of variables which are the same, and, well, have the same probability distribution, and I add them all up, then if the number of variables is large, I always get a normal distribution. So the sum of a large number of variables is always normally distributed. So just some results on this. I've got the mean of a single variable is equal to mu, right? So the mean of the sum x1 plus, plus xn is therefore equal to n mu. One is the mean of a single variable is mu then, so the mean of the sum is equal to n times mu. So therefore in, in this equation here, when I subtract n mu, that is what ensures that the mean is zero here. The sum of these variables here has mean n mu, and I subtract n mu, so therefore the mean here is zero. We can also talk about the variance. The variance of a single variable is sigma squared, so when I take the variance of the sum, because they're independent, that's why it's important that they're independent, because they're independent, this is equal to n times sigma squared, So therefore, the standard deviation this is the width of the distribution is equal to the square root of this, n times sigma. So the variance, the square root of the variance is called the standard deviation, and the standard deviation is the measure of the width of the distribution. So the width of the distribution is square root of n times sigma, and therefore in this formula, by dividing by the square root of n times sigma, we ensure that 
the standard deviation is 1 here. So that explains why the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. What I haven't explained and what I will not explain is why it becomes normally distributed. So when I add lots of these variables together, why do you get a normal distribution? Well, that's hard to prove, so I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'll just state the result. But why is this important for us? This means that um, the sum x1 up to xn of many variables which are identically distributed and independent is approximately normal normal in the precise the technical sense of being a normal distribution is approximately normal with mean equal to n times mu and variance equal to n times sigma squared. So an important consequence of this result, that the mean is like n mu and the variance like n sigma squared, is that the distribution becomes narrow. The mean grows like n, but the width of the distribution is the square root of the variance, and that grows like the square root of n. So the mean of the distribution grows like n, but the width only grows like the square root of n, and therefore the distribution itself becomes narrow. So if I try and draw this then, suppose then here is the distribution of x, So in the case that n equals 1, I've got a distribution which looks like this. It, has, it doesn't have to be normally distributed, but it will have some shape. Okay. It will have some mean. Uh, not like I've drawn it that way. It will have some mean here. Mu. And it has some characteristic width. Sigma. Now, if we add more of these together, let's suppose I add four of them together. And I'll draw it from the same diagram. So if I add four of them together, the mean is now four times the original mean. So this is now four mu. from this formula here, the mean is four times the original mean, but the variance is four times the original variance. That means the width is only twice the original width, because the width is the square root of the variance. So then this will now have half the width of the original okay, relative to the mean. It gets narrower. And if you keep going, if we go to n equals 100, then the mean is 100 now, 100 times mu. But the width is only the square root. So the width is only 10 times as much, and therefore the distribution looks very narrow indeed.
So I add, as I add more and more of these independent, identically distributed distributions together, first of all, the distribution, the shape, becomes normal. And secondly, the width relatively becomes narrow. So relative to the size of the mean, the width of the distribution becomes small. And that's very important for what we will, for, that's very impo important for the theory of statistical mechanics. This fact that if I add lots of variables together, the distribution becomes narrow. So I want, I want to give you some examples of this to try and make it seem more, well, make you more used to this idea of the central limit theorem. So I've prepared a presentation. This is a handout of it here. So I'm going to show you in, this, in these slides a number of examples. So what you have to look out for is firstly that the shape becomes like it's normal, and secondly that the distribution becomes narrow. So I give three different examples. The first one is the binomial distribution. And I choose that p is a half in this. So you can imagine it as a coin tossing experiment. You take a coin. A coin has two sides, right? So I take a coin and I throw it. And I see, does it land this side or does it land this side? Okay. And I count the number of times that it lands this time. So in this first one, this is in the case of 10. So I throw the coin 10 times. And I count the number of times that it lands this way. And you get a probability distribution which looks like this. This is zero times like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this means that if you throw the coin ten times, the most probable result is that five times it will be like this, and five times it will be like that, which is what you'd expect. So each coin toss is an independent and identically distributed variable. So this means we can apply the normal, the central limit theorem. Okay. So this is the result after 10 throws of the coin. After 20, it looks like this. After 30, like this. After 40, like this. And after 50, like this. So the first point I wanted to note is that it gets narrow. Okay. The width of the distribution here, the characteristic width is something like this. Right? But as I add more coin tosses, the distribution gets narrower. It gets narrower. So if I just go through it quickly, you can see. Okay. So it gets narrower. The second thing is, it should look like a normal distribution. And I can check that by fitting the mean and variance to a normal distribution and seeing what the result looks like. And if you do that, you get this. So this is the result of the coin experiment throwing the coins. And the normal distribution with the same mean and variance looks like this. So you see it's exactly the same. There's no difference in any, well, no, there is a difference. But there's no visible difference in any of these points. So the, the blue curve is a normal distribution. The black lines are this binomial distribution, this coin tossing experiment. And you see that they're the same. So this is the, an example of the central limit theorem. As I throw the coin many, many times, the distribution becomes narrow, and it becomes normally distributed. Now, the other two examples of this are to show that the, when I stated the central limit theorem, I said that these x1, x2, x3, and so on have to be independent. So x1 does not affect x2, and so on. And they have to be identically distributed. So they should have the same distribution. So that's the statement of the classical central limit theorem. But I wanted to show you that this is not essential. So even if you consider variables which have different distributions, or you consider variables where there is some interaction, there is some dependence, between the variables, the central limit theorem is still correct. In other words, if I add lots of them together, I will still get a normal distribution, which gets narrower as I add more of these variables together. So this is, 
I do two examples of this. This one is in biased dice. So for a normal dice, okay. for a normal dice, there are six possible results, right? I throw the dice, I either get one, two, three, four, five, or six. And for normal dice, each one is equally probable, and each one has probability equal to one over six. Right? This is a normal dice. But I'm going to suppose I've got kind of lopsided dice, which have funny mass distributions or whatever, so that some numbers are more likely than others. So I, I generated these just by asking the computer to pick random numbers. So I assume on the first dice it looks like this. So the first dice is a funny shape or whatever. It has a very low probability of getting a 4 and a higher than average probability of getting, say, a 5. So it's an unfair dice. Um, distribution of x2, wait, that's not, that looks the same. Okay, there's a mistake here. Then these two distributions should not be the same. Okay, so I, I choose x1 to look like this. I need to change this. I choose x2 to look like this. So each dice has a different shape. It has a different distribution of numbers. So when I add the distributions of the first two dice, I get something which looks like this. Two dice added together can get me any number between 1 and 12. Oh, sorry, between 2 and 12. So I get a funny distribution like this. It doesn't look normal yet. But if I keep going, so I add another random dice, which has this distribution, then I get a distribution which looks like this. If I add another random dice like this, you can see it's starting to become more like a normal distribution. And again, I keep going. So each dice is random. It has a completely random probability distribution. But as I add them all together, I end up with something which looks very nice. Okay. And again, we can fit the normal distribution. For the case of adding two of them together, it's not very good. Right? There's a big disagreement. If I add four of these random dice together, the agreement is al already pretty good. Right, there's not much difference between the blue curve, which is a normal distribution, and the black curve, which is the results. And if I add 10 of these dice together, then the agreement is all, almost perfect. So there's no difference between throwing 10 dice or picking a random number from the normal distribution. So I give this example to show you it doesn't really matter so much that the distributions should be the same. In this example, all of the distributions were different, right? All the distributions were different, but I still got a normal distribution at the end. Okay. So the third example is to showing you that the independence condition can also be weakened somewhat. If there is some dependence, between the dice, it can still be true that we get a normal distribution. So this is a final example. In this case, I roll dice, which I assume to be even dice. So I assume my dice to be like this. They are fair, normal dice. But I say that whatever I roll, I can't roll again the next time. Right? So for example, if I roll a dice and I get three, like this, and then I roll another dice. And I get another three. Then I say that's not allowed. So the if the first dice is three, the second dice cannot be three. I, I roll it again until I get four or five or something. So this is dependence, right? The result of the, result of the first dice affects the result of the second dice. If the first dice is a three, the second dice is not a three. If the second dice is a 1, the third dice is not a 1. Right? So there is some dependence between the dice when I roll them. But again, you can calculate what the probability distributions look like with this dependence between the results. So for 1, it's just a normal dice. For 2, you get a result which looks like this. Okay. And we can keep going for 3, for 4, for 5, for 
six, and you see again, it's forming into a normal distribution, right? Seven, eight, nine. Okay. So I only went up to eight here, I guess. So you see again, for eight dice, even though there is this dependence, this rule that the result of the first dice affects the result of the second dice, it's still true that we end up with a normal distribution. And it's still true, the other result I said, is that the distribution gets narrower. Right? And if you look at these slides put together, you see that the distribution is getting narrower as I increase the number of dice. So the classical statement of the central limit theorem only applies to variables which are independent and identically distributed. But in most cases, the central limit theorem is true, i.e. the result that you get a normal distribution, which is narrow, is true even if these conditions are not strictly met. You, we can relax these conditions to some extent. Okay. So, just before we finish, I want to explain why is this important. So why is this important? At least, okay, it's, it's important to mathematicians anyway, by definition, I guess. Why is it important for statistical physics? Suppose I've got a number of particles in a box. So here's a box. It's filled up of particles. Which, and each particle, I said, has energy EI. So EI is the energy of each particle. So if I've got n particles in a box, let's say there are n, n particles in a box, each particle has energy EI, then the total energy U is equal to the sum of the energy of the particles, right? So this U is one of the things we've been talking about in thermodynamics, right? The energy of the system, U. If a system is made up of a number of particles, then the total energy of the system is just the sum of the energies of each particle. Okay, that's trivial, but the problem is we don't know this. If I look at a gas, I can't tell you what the energy of each particle is. But it is possible to work out a probability distribution for this energy. So we don't know what is epsilon i. Okay, we can't measure the energy of every single particle in the system. But we can, through methods I will explain after the midterm exam, we can find the probability distribution for the i. So if we can find the probability distribution, then we can treat each particle energy EI as a random variable and I've got U which is the sum of these random variables. So therefore if N is very large then by the central limit theorem This will go to a normal distribution where the mean is proportional to the. Ah, okay. This is a problem now because I'm using n for normal and n for number of particles, but okay. you'll have to live with it. The mean is equal to n times the average energy. Okay. And the width of the distribution is equal to n times the variance of the energy, right? So, 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 I haven't been particularly clear here. Here, the variance of the energy I define to be equal to sigma squared. If I add lots of them together, then the combined variance is n sigma squared. 
So I can plot the probability of having internal energy U, and according to the central limit theorem, if I add lots of these particles together, then there is some average value here, and the distribution is normal, and it's very sharply peaked around the average value. So this should be symmetrical. So as long as the central limit theorem holds true for this distribution of particle energies in the system I'm considering, then I can apply it to easily predict what the energy of the system should be, just from a knowledge of what the probability distribution of the individual particles is. So in this way, I don't have to know the energy of every particle. I just ha all I need to know is the probability distribution. That's why it's important. Okay. And the fact it's narrow means that u is almost always the same value for fixed system parameters. But th there's an issue here which is the reason I, I made the PowerPoint in the way I did. The particles can interact. If I've got a system with particles moving around, they interact with each other. That means the probability distribution P of each particle is not independent. Right? This means that the variables epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon, epsilon n, are not independent or identically distributed. They interact. So the energy of one particle can affect the energy of other particles because, because of the interaction. Okay? So in general, I can't treat them as independent and identically distributed, so I need to apply a more general version of the central limit theorem than the usual mathematical statement. But as I said, from the examples I've given, you see that usually the central limit theorem, the central limit theorem works even for dependent variables with different distributions. So this is a kind of preview of what we're going to be doing after the midterm exam. We're going to be using arguments like this to calculate actually what is the energy of a system, which is the thing we ultimately want to know. So for example, in this way, we'll be able to prove that the energy of an ideal gas is equal to N times CV times T, for example. And here is the average energy. Right? So this is one of the results we will prove and we will prove it using arguments like this, okay, based upon probability. 